many ways, in many ways, we we need to be more sensitive to the text of Plato's dialogues. And many people will misread the symposium, I think, because they're not sensitive to the to the distinction in the characters. And if I were just this is a, this is a dialogue that I could probably get in a lot of trouble for talking about. Let me just start out. Let me just start out by saying, I don't know anything about anybody's personal life. Okay, so anything I say tonight, I don't mean I don't mean anything as far as your personal life goes. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean it's just a, no, no. This is no. This is a topic. This dialogue involves a topic. It's a sensitive topic. That's all. And I remember in the past talking about a topic related to this when I was when I was uh, giving a, se a seminar on Dostoevsky, and I got turned in for it. Okay, so I don't mean to. In other words, my only point is I don't mean to offend anybody by what I'm saying, and I'm just going to try to say what I think are the ideas of the dialogue. And and I I, I almost know that I'm sure I won't offend any of you, but. I just want to, I want to, I want to have that on record as I start out. It's recorded. <laughs> now, <laughs> the next point I want to make is that there, there's an author of the 20th century named Leo Strauss, and he wrote a book called Persecution and the Art of Writing. And in this book, Persecution in the Art of Writing, one of the things he makes clear is that authors will sometimes not explicitly state their teaching, but they'll leave hints and clues in their dialogues or in their writings, in part because they realize they're living in a culture that is so set against the philosophy they hope to, uh, they hope to propose that they fear being killed or persecuted in some sense if they were to if they were to just come out explicitly and say their philosophy another reason for another another concern would be that they want people ultimately to adopt their philosophy and so they try as much as they can to speak in the language of their opponents even if they have to as a way of hopefully trying to win over their opponents to their side i think this is why Plato, or Strauss argues, this is why Plato writes in the dialogue format. He's trying to both protect himself because he realizes he has much, he, there's much in Greek Athenian society that he is critical of. And secondly, he wants to try and, as best as he can, uh, meet his opponents on their own ground and lead them to the truth. And that's why he writes in dialogue form, right? He writes in dialogue form so he can set up a situation where there really was a dialogue or where he recreates or reconstructs what could have been a dialogue between Socrates and some sophists. Now, having said that, the typical way that Socrates would be presented as, and sometimes this is the way that when people talk about Christianity, Right, they'll talk about how. I remember there was a, a guy, there was a priest that told my dad in the 60s, said, You have to break all traditions. You have to break all traditions. Break all the prejudices of the past. And, and when, whenever I talk with my dad about philosophy, my dad will say, Oh, yeah, no, that's kind of like what Socrates is. Right, so, someone breaking all the traditions, breaking with the past. Or sometimes you'll see that going back to the French Revolution and up until the 60s, revolutionaries are always suggesting, Freud was big on this, that somehow up until 17, 1890, right, Western civilization was oppressed sexually or repressed sexually. And somehow with Freud, we're liberating our instincts. And so they would say Socrates, they would present Socrates in kind of a disingenuous way They would read him as a kind of a, a guy who, if he were living in modern times, would liberate us from stodgy Victorian sexual morality. Or they might present Jesus Christ in the same way, right? That Christ would have come out and 
been more open about sexual things, except he was living in this backward Palestinian society. And I think that's the that's the general picture with which we with which we approach our education, and that's the general picture with which most intellectuals teach theology, philosophy, economics, psychology, pretty much every topic, English. And what I want to suggest is that that's wrong. <laughs> that if you if you look at if you look at Socrates. And if you apply this idea that he's somehow meeting people with their R and critiquing the society that he's in, he's actually critiquing. Ultimately, he is critiquing forms of love, any really any form of love that exists outside of marriage. So ultimately... Sexual or non-sexual. I mean, non-sexual could exist outside of marriage. And actually, he will say in the end that the highest kind of love is the virgin love. Because it's purely spiritual. But I guess what I'm saying is that as far as physical... Maybe I'm saying this. As far as physical love goes, if we were to take... Actually, many of the modern examples were present in the ancient world. Contraception homosexual love between two men, homosexual love between a man and a boy, adultery, which, which is uh, you know love between a man and a woman when one of them is married, and then also fornication, which would be a kind of love outside of the marital con, con, uh, covenant when neither one is married, right? So all those forms of love Socrates is critiquing in this dialogue. And it's actually, I, I don't think it's that hard to get that meaning. I mean, I think it's almost a surface reading of the dialogue that gives us that meaning. If you're just sensitive, if, you just, if you've gone through enough sensitivity training, then you should, you should be able to pick up on that from the words of the dialogue, especially knowing, especially knowing who the main interlocker in other words who the characters are in the dialogue all the characters in the dialogue are students they are either students of sophists or they are poets and pretty much every pretty much the indications we have in the dialogue is that each is, is it's like many of the other dialogues each character says something which, which might sound right in the right context. They give an element of the definition of love or what love is. But ultimately, it, it, it falls short. And the trick that Plato uses in this dialogue for, I think, giving out the truth is twofold. On the one hand, when, rather than have Socrates speak the truth about love, he has Di Socrates has Diotimus give it. And again, that's the way that that's the way within the context of the dialogue that Socrates can hide his own teaching. And then Plato has Alcibiades, who's the drunk man at the end. Else, remember in vino veritas, right? In drunkenness is the truth. There's something. That's right. There are some things that Alcibiades will say that are that are true. And if you notice. What Plato has Socrates do at the very end of Alcibiades' speech, Alcibiades says, I swear everything I say is true and everything he has to say about Socrates. And Socrates pulls off a little trick of humility. Right? He, read, he, says, he says, oh, Alcibiades. Alcibiades is just upset. He says to everybody, Alcibiades is just upset that um, Agathon sat next to me instead of him. Because Alcibiades wants the love of Agathon. And so everybody at that point is drunk enough. They haven't held to their... In the beginning of the dialogue, Agathon says, we got to stay sober tonight, but they don't. And so by... One of them is already drunk. Right. But then by the end of the dialogue, though, everybody falls asleep. Nobody can stay up for the final conversation except for Aristophanes. And I forget who now. It's Aristophanes and another A guy. Agathon, right. Aristophanes and Agathon stay up at the end. 
But even during that conversation, Aristophanes falls asleep. And during that conversation, Socrates is trying to convince them both that you shouldn't just be comedic or a tragedian. You should be both if you're a playwright. Because Agathon had won, Agathon won the crown, he won the wreath that year for being the best tragic poet. And Aristophanes, by that time, had established his reputation as the best comedic poet. And so, anyway, so there's all these little hints that uh, basically, so for example, almost all the characters in this dialogue show up in the Protagoras. And almost all the characters in this dialogue, if you look at them in the Protagoras, they're sitting at the feet of some sophist. The name Aristodemus, remember it means the guy who thinks the people are noble. Pausinius, uh, he's in the same school with Prodicus, the sophist. In Protagoras, he is reclining at the table, or at a couch, with Agathon and Prodicus. <laughs> I think the suggestion from the Protagoras is that Pausinius and Agathon are lovers. Phaedrus. Phaedrus is related to both Callicles and Euripides. Euripides is the great uncle of Phaedrus. Phaedrus... Phaedrus is also a cousin of Aristophanes. And Phaedrus in the Protagoras is sitting at the feet of Hippias. Right? So, many of the characters in this dialogue also, Phaedrus and Pausinius, they are suspected in 14... This dialogue is set in 1416. Uh, many of the characters in this dialogue are suspected, including Alcibiades. One four one six. You said fourteen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Four sixteen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're off by at least a thousand years. Yes, subtract a thousand. No, no, more than a thousand years. Well, yeah. Fourteen sixteen eighty. Eighteen hundred years. Or fourteen sixteen. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Four sixteen. Four sixteen. So. The mysteries were profaned in 415 before leaving for the Battle of Syracuse. The night before leaving for the Battle of Syracuse, there were two things that happened. They supposedly profaned the mysteries, which means they probably like put graffiti on them, and then they mutilated the statues of the Hermes. Does everybody understand what that is? They mutilated the statues. The statues of the Hermes were nude statues of little men that represented Hermes and they mutilated them and that was a sacrilege because again in the Greek religion they worshipped the body parts right the body always ask for chips also in the year 416 Agathon as I said had won the, uh, the prize for the best trage tragedian now, by the way, I think if I were just on a point of, of teaching theory, theories of education, theories of teaching, I would distinguish between Christ and Socrates as far as teaching methods on this point of the art of persecution, persecution in the art of writing. If you think about it, if you go through and you read the Gospels about teaching methods, how Christ taught. I think Christ is much more forthright at times. Not all the times. But at times, he and his disciples are very clear about pointing out what they say are, what they think are injustices, immoral behavior, proposing hell as a teaching. I read a passage by Nietzsche over the weekend. Not that I don't read Nietzsche for fun, but I have another class in which I'm teaching him. And he, Nietzsche basically condemns Christ for all the times that he mentions hell. And he lists about 30 times that Christ mentions hell. Basically, so as to condemn Christ and say, look, this guy is a real SOB. Because again, for, for Nietzsche, 
Christ, and I shouldn't have said that, I'm sorry, but for Nietzsche, Christ is one of his great enemies. So, I would say it could be a distinction between an educational theory between Christ and Nietzsche on this point. That Christ might, in the end, be much more straightforward than Socrates is about the truth of things. Now, I'm just going to go through each speech and I'm going to characterize what I think each speech represents as far as its vision of love. I kind of thought that tonight's theme song could have been uh, that song by Led Zeppelin. Talk about love. Right? That could have been the... They could have played that at the beginning of the, of the symposium. Talk about love. Anyway, Phaedrus... Phaedrus, his speech basically identifies love as pleasure. And the highest pleasure, the highest kind of pleasure, is the homosexual love between a man and a boy. And this could be in two forms. This could be in a kind of platonic form, in which there's no physical relationship, but it could, as in the case of Achilles and Patroclus. But it could also be in a, in a consummated form like the pedophile party of the Netherlands. Right? So the pedophile party of the Netherlands, they would rely on the speech of Phaedrus to justify what they're, what they're all about. Like Phaedrus says that the greatest army would be an army of men and boys fighting together. Now, it's important, I think, to remember, I, I think this... I could be wrong on this because uh, I'm not I'm not the biggest expert in the world, but I think that he distinguishes between two kinds of of a kind of mentor relationship between a man and a boy. One kind is the homosexual kind. The other kind is more of a mentor relationship of teaching. You know, like student and master and student or teacher and student. That kind is, is I think that's what's called platonic. You know, platonic non-physical. And Phaedrus admits that this is one possibility. And this is not beyond the realm of Christian understanding, right? Christ, John was known as the beloved apostle. Right? That Christ had a special love for John because John followed Christ from the time he was 16. From the time he was a very young man. Pausinius, I think his understanding of love is the uh, Pausinius' understanding of love is the love of uh, it's kind of the cultural relativist understanding of love. And it's basically I think his kind of love is like refined utilitarianism. Ultimately, he says there's, he starts out by saying there's vulgar love and then there's more refined love, right? The <laughs> vulgar love would be the love where someone, they have instinct. This would be like the crass Nietzsche. Someone feels instinct to love and follow and jumps on it right away, right? They, they go right away to sex. And so Pausinius says the real kind of love is refined love. It's the kind of love that suppresses instinct as long as possible and gets really refined in the way of love. It turns love into kind of an art. It turns so so it's he kind of has the people who would be like Pausinius I think would be would be the romantics of the 19th century. Lord Byron. Right that or, uh, yeah, it'd be the romantics of the 19th century. I've probably told you the story of, uh, you know, Mar Mary Wollstonecraft was kind of this kind of, of lover. And so was her daughter. Right? Mary Wollstonecraft, she realized at some point that the French Revolution was awesome because it made for easy divorce, which basically allowed for free love relationships. So... She decided in 1792 
that she would run off to France. John, can you get the wig? Can I get some silverware? She decided that she would run off to France and have a love affair with a with the man that summer, and uh, she did. And at the end of the summer, she got pregnant, and the man ran off. He was an American, typical American. He ran off. He abandoned her in her pregnancy, and she uh, she had a child, and then she eventually returned to English England, depressed. She eventually, against her moral convictions, she actually married someone. William Goodwin, but he was also marrying her against his moral convictions because Goodwin and Wollstonecraft, they didn't believe in marriage, right? But they said they married anyway because custom demanded it. Well, that's Pausinius, right? You only marry because custom demands it. And in fact, in part of his analysis of, of love is just analyzing different cultures and how they regulate marriage. Because why? There's no ultimate truth in marriage. It's just something we have to regulate. Mary's, Mary Wollstonecraft, she had a second child. Her first child was named Elizabeth. Her second child was named Mary. And Mary Wollstonecraft died not long after giving birth to Mary. And Mary became the uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, when Mary, Mary, Mary Shelley had a kind of great devotion to her mother, her dead mother's memory. And when Mary Shelley was about 16 or 18, she decided that she and her sister Elizabeth would go down to Geneva one summer with Lord Byron and with Perse Bis Shelley, or whatever the guy's name is, the, the poet Shelley. And they had a free love relate. They had a free love summer of free love in Geneva in 1814. Well, in other words, everybody shared everybody. It's like right? In that, in that, in that, in that, uh, in that Geneva, in that summer of free love in Geneva, everybody shared everybody. Lord Byron with Shelley. I mean, all all the possible con combinations happened, and they kept notes and all that kind of stuff just to, to prove it. So. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to get too much into the details here, but. That's, that's part of the birth of romanticism, right? And kind of one of the ultimate romantic poets would be, would be Shelley. Shelley. Shelley did a translation of the symposium in which he idolized, especially he especially idolized the earlier speeches of the symposium as being the expression of true love. And that per Percy became Shelley, sorry, or Percy Shelley, his... He became kind of the father of 19th century romanticism in the English world. Now, eventually, Shelley abandoned Mary Shelley, and then he died in a boat accident. And then Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. And I, my theory is that Frankenstein was an attempt to understand morality. And, and Mary Shelley wasn't willing to access traditional morality because she hated it because her mother hated it. But she was sometimes trying to explain the problems of modern society and the problems of Mr. Shelley, the poet. And so Frankenstein was her outlet. It might have been, but that does but I think the motivation of it is this. So while her husband was still alive. Well yeah, but it was before he died, but it was after she had been abandoned. It was after she had abandoned her. Now, due to the excesses of the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolution in England, that's the rise of Victorian England. Right? There's a kind of suppression of romanticism. And in the in, in, a, in the same thing it happens both in England and in the United States. By the end of the 19th century, it comes out again. In the US it comes out in the transcendentalists and especially in the poetry of Walt Whitman, right? Walt Whitman idolizes all sorts of love. If ever you want to read, read a great poem making fun of Walt Whitman, <laughs> read G.K. Chesterton's Variations on a Theme. 
he does all the different ways. The, diff the way different poets would do Old King Cole was a merry old soul. And the last one is how Walt Whitman would do Old King Cole. I don't remember it though, but just I remember it's very funny. If you're reading it with an educated group of people that know poetry, they will usually stop and laugh at every line. Uh, in England, the utilitarians like Mill and Bentham and, and their followers towards the end of the 19th century, they helped revitalize these notions of, of ancient Greek notions of love, homosexual love, adultery, fornication, and things like that. And it came to fruition in England in the early 20th century in what's called the Bloomsbury Group or the Bloomsbury Circle. Virginia Woolf was the, was the house mother of the Bloomsbury Circle. They basically saw themselves as revitalizing and continuing what, what Shelley started in the early 19th century. Another guy, another guy who was in the Bloomsbury Group was Maynard Ke Lord Maynard Keynes of Keynesian economics fame. And uh, again, the Bloomsbury Group would, would, would accept and promote all forms of sexual behavior. Virginia Woolf, all the fathers of 20th century analytical philosophy were also members of the Bloomsbury Group, G.E. Moore and A.J. A. Ayer and people like that. So the Bloomsbury Group was a small circle of people in England who basically you can look at all, all the disastrous economic, political, and philosophical theories that came out of England and influenced most of European and American culture in the 20th century all kind of came out of the Bloomsbury Group, which was a revitalization of the first four speeches of the symposium. So Pausinius, he analyzes love according to cultures, Athenian culture, Elian culture, Persian, and then Greek. He kind of condemns Persia as being Puritan. He really condemns Persia as being the equivalent of a Puritanical culture. He says Pur uh, Persia condemns love, they condemn philosophy, and they condemn sports. In Persia, there's no ambition to do great things. There's no ambition to do great things. There's no bonds of friendship. And actually, he, he, he uses a kind of typical comment that would be used even nowadays that people might make about the Catholic Church. He says, you know, people say, oh, the Catholic Church hates sex or something like that. He says, those who hate love are the equivalent of basically power mongers. Those who, like the, those who hate love are the equivalent of fascists, right? The Catholic Church is fascist because it hates love. It hates sexual liberation. Anybody who hates love is weak. Nietzsche would say that about Socrates and Christ, right? That they ruined love. They made us weak by hating love. So Pausinius says, in a real society, we would, we would basically break customs. We would come out of the closet and we would, we would basically make love an open thing. We would, we would make society more open to all forms of love. The noblest kind of love, though, he says, is complex, right? It depends on how you go about it. But the noblest kind of love would be some kind of permanent attachment to a person. Customs that societies have are okay because they slow down instinct and they make love more stable or permanent than money or power. I would say that in the end, Pausinius would be an advocate of same-sex unions or of civil unions or same-sex marriage, right? He would provide the argument for same-sex marriage. Allow for same-sex marriage because a lot of homosexual love is vulgar. People have 600 partners. Um, and if we allow for same-sex marriage, it will make homosexual love more refined. That's the basic... By the way, I, I mean, I remember when, when the same-sex marriage was first being debated, 
in this country anyway, in about 2002 or so, my argument was that if, if they were to allow for same-sex marriage, probably 10% of the homosexual couples would get married because many of them don't want marriage. They like the idea of just having multiple partners. And I was wrong. And they, the, so the first... No, I was. The first, sociology, the first sociological studies that are coming out on, on homosexuals that actually follow up and get married... It's about 2% of the homosexual population. <laughs> that's why I was laughing. Well, no, I mean, it's, but that's, oh, I'm sorry, but that's just the fact. I mean, I'm, no, I'm just, I know, but you were wrong. Drastically okay. wrong. <laughs> I'm just admitting my error. <laughs> there was a spike in Massachusetts during the first year. It was about 16%. Because there was an influx from everywhere to go there to get married. But then that, that kind of went down afterwards. Eric Simakis is the next speaker. And I think his, his notion of love is love as Viagra. He's the Bob Dole of the symposium. If, if Bob Dole were in the symposium, he would give the speech of Eric Simakis. <laughs> he would. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry if I'm making fun of. I, maybe I shouldn't make political commentary, but. <laughs> but Eric Samakis. Well, you don't know their personal lives. No, I mean, but just the, he did the commercial, man. I mean, come on. If he did the commercial, he's he's open game. Eric Samakis basically says that love is an attraction to beauty. And the body, the body is kind of energized by this attraction. So we should use medicine to replenish the body and to get it going, to, you know, to give rise, you know, to basically to realize this attraction. And so it's kind of a medical art and it might be some other, whatever other kind of art. We, we should try to do things that prolong this attraction. Now, I'm going to say some things here that are outrageous, but no, I mean, for example, you know, there's a whole new study of sexology, and they try to study stuff like, you know, how to make the desire last in you for four hours, or there is a branch of, there, no, there, there is a branch of Hinduism, this is disgusting, right? But there is a branch of Hinduism, this is comparative religion, there is a, <laughs> it is, there is a branch. No, there is, but there is a branch of, of Hinduism where they try to basically see how long they can prolong sexual excitement. Like in American Pie. I didn't see American Pie. I don't know. That's such a terrible movie to bring up. Right? No, no, but it could be. No, no, but it could be. It could be. No, so they will. But, you are right. So they will, they, but in this in this branch of Hinduism, the gurus will sit on the doorstep, showing the fruits of their efforts. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Sam. <laughs> I don't want clarification. Um. No, but it's true. I'm just saying, I'm just comparative religion, man. I mean, just to give you a sense. I mean, I'm just giving you a sense <laughs> of how. No, it's Eric Samakis. Yeah, but Pusinius is the comparative religion. Right. Well, um, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of creating a new category here. <laughs> I'm using Hosinius to, to show Eric Samakis' ends. <laughs> now, in some sense, what's important though about this is that all these guys are giving. I mean, they're they're giving what are the accepted arguments, at least among the sophists and playwrights and the elite of Athenian society. All right. And some say it's the same, the same, many of the same arguments that our elite are giving now in our society. Why does Socrates say that he gave this? The what? Why does Socrates say that this used to be his argument? Eric Samakis? Or no, he says Agatha. We'll get there. Eric Samakis also says, well, this art of love, right? What things can you do to cultivate instinct? You can use music. Because music trains the feelings. Right? Music can music can help work up love 
Music can train the feelings. The best pleasures are the refined pleasures. Right? The best pleasures are the refined pleasures. Right? How to eat, how to eat, you know, in a very gluttonous but refined way. Or how to, how to drink in a, I don't know, all these different things. There, there's a famous saint who says that sin, even if it is dressed in finely, you know, finely put together silk clothing, it is still sin. What saint? Jose Maria Escrivá. So Eric Samakis says we need to properly control love. He says we can even use religious divination to control love. That is, I, I think that would be what we would call astrology. So even astrology can help us kind of control love properly. <laughs> mean, mean, to mean what? Yeah, control the effect, kind of help the art, help develop the art. It's talking about astrology, basically. Or Dr. Ruth or Joyce Brothers. You know, Dr. Ruth would like Eric Samakis and Joy, Dr. Joyce Brothers and all these... All these uh, preverts, Pre prevertesses. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. That was inappropriate. But we're in a bar. Family Yeah, kids are welcome. That's what it's That's right. Now the next the next interlocutor or character is Aristophanes. And his version of love, his myth of love, Aristophanes, his myth of love is the fall of the Tasmanian devils. I like to call it the fall of the Tasmanian devils. You've seen the Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? Where the Tasmanian devil, the way he moves around is by spinning around. That's how he shows his power. Have you seen that? Well, that, that's the way Aristophanes describes perfect human nature, <laughs> right? So Aristophanes says, love, the whole point of love is that love makes us whole again. Love cures all ills by making us W-H-O-L-E again. It cures all ills. He says, right now we think there are two human natures. And by the way, Aristophanes gives the example of a myth that Socrates is critical of. Because it's a myth that's false. Ultimately, the, our, our myths or our stories, Socrates won't deny that there might, Socrates will say, I think, in the end, there might be something true in the myth that Aristophanes tells us. But you got to say that, you got to say the story in a better way than Aristophanes does, even though Aristophanes' myth is pretty funny. So what is Aristophanes' myth? Aristophanes says, well, originally, there weren't two human natures. There were three. Right? There were males, females, and androgynous people. Meaning, and everybody, every person was a, was a sphere. And on one side of the sphere was the head. Right? Each side of the sphere, everybody had two of everything. Or every, no, I shouldn't say that. Everybody had double of what they have right now. Okay, so they had two faces, two sets of private parts, basically two, four legs, four arms. They had double of everything, but they were in, we were all in kind of spheres, circular spheres. And we ran around like Tasmanian devils. We spun around like Tasmanian devils. And we had great ambition, and we wanted to become like the gods. Zeus and the gods decided to punish men and women and, andro no, and uh, androids. And so what they did, what they did is, is they basically, imagine they just, they, ba they basically just took a knife and they cut everybody in two. And then what they did is they, when they cut everybody in two, they sewed up the na the, the navel is the is the sewing up of the backside, and then the chest is also the sewing up of the backside, and then they turned around the face, and they turned basically they turned around everything, and then what happens now is that now everybody is seeking their other half. Everybody is seeking their other half, so homosexuals, men, 
are men who are born seeking their other half. And men who see heterosexuals are men or women that are seeking their the other half of their adron, androgynous selves. And lesbians are women who are seeking their other halves from the original spheroids that we all were. But what, what, what Aristophanes says is the most important thing is not sex. Right? The most important thing is that we are trying to regain our wholeness or we are trying to regain our unity. There's a desire for unity that the human person is seeking. And marriage is something that helps us. Custom helps us to marry. And when we meet the one who is our other half, we click. So it's not just... What would be better for the lovers than to be joined eternally? Right. It's not just sex that draws us to other people. It's this, it's this desire for oneness or wholeness or to be complete. Yes. And basically, I think Aristophanes would say, if we don't seek wholeness or if we don't seek unity, the, nature demands that we seek unity or to be complete. By the way, I think Aquinas in the, in the treatise on happiness, in the first five questions of the first part of the second part of the Summa Theologica, he, he's building on he's building on what's the fruit of this dialogue. Anyway, I think Aristophanes would say if we don't seek wholeness or oneness, then Pablo Picasso will get a hold of us, and he will slice up our body parts and put them in pictures like Picasso does. Right? Our goal is unity. Unity is the fruit of perfect love or perfect wholeness. And unity is independent of what the body does. So that's Aristophanes. Now, Agathon is next. Does anybody have anything they want to say or ask at this point? Yes. Was it like you can get that? I, I know that like the core understanding of the original condition of man and the nature having changed and Aristophanes is like on the fact but was it a common thing for them to think for, for, was it a common thing among the Greek culture to think that the original kind of state of man was different than the current state of man? That human nature underwent some sort of change? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that because even though that ch what the nature of that change is would differ and is important, of course, the fact that they would admit that there was some sort of change is kind of it, it has an affinity for like the understanding of the Yeah. The myth the myth the myth is the myth of Prometheus, right? I think the I think the, the primary myth or the teaching of many of the myths is that somehow Man saw too much technological advance. Right? Prometheus tried to steal fire from heaven. It would give man power. And so man was he was cast down to earth and he was made to lack scientific knowledge or to lack technical knowledge. And this was his punishment for trying to be too much like the gods. And did, did Socrates generally like We'll get to this in the We'll get to this in the Timaeus. Oh, by the way, in the laws, if you want to look up, I think, what might be the fruit of this dialogue at the symposium, you can read the laws, points 383 to, sorry, 838, 838, Stephanus number, 838 to 841. In, in, those, in those points, basically... He says the only thing that's really allowable is marriage and marriage that leads to procreation. Anything else could be punished should be punished. Yeah. So he's okay with like friendship. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll find this out even in this dialogue. Now Agathon won Tragedy of the Year in eight sixteen. Agathon is a student of Gorgias. 
And by the way, Agathon, at the end of his life, he ended up being the, po the court poet for a tyrant in Macedonia. He says, love is the best quality of the gods. Love is youthful. It hates what is old. It's refined. It's graceful. Pleasant to look at. So if I, if I were to give numbers, I would. this is where I'd give numbers, right? Number one, yeah, it's youthful. Number two, it's refined. Number three, it's graceful. Number four, pleasant to look at. Five, it leads to virtue. Right? It never harms. It is not violent. It is not forced. Love, yes. If you were to take an exhaustive list, could you add anything to it? Whether or not it's true? He says basically everything that you could possibly say in praise of any. Right. It's, no, it's completely rhetorical. I mean, that's what Socrates, the first thing Socrates says is that, oh, Agathon, you spoke rhetorically very well. I love your rhetoric. <laughs> right? So it's temperate. There's self-control. Someone who loves will rule their passions. They will have fortitude. They will be prudent. Someone who loves will give rise to a new birth. Love also makes a man famous because what he loves, he is passionate about and he will do well and he'll develop a good reputation for it. He also says love is free and chosen. It's not done of necessity. Now, Socrates responds, and he basically, def I think the notion of love, that he basically will argue that the highest form of love is virgin love. And virgin love, now we're on to Socrates and Diotima. Virgin love is the love of someone who lives celibacy. That's the highest kind of love. The second, the second kind of love is marital love. And all other kinds of love, homosexual, adulterous, love outside of marriage, they are secondary or lower participations in true love. <laughs> so, what does he mean when he says, and, and what he says is that in his discussions with Diotima, he starts to discover the philosophical defense of what love is. All the other speeches, they don't speak about what love is, they speak about qualities of love. Love, what is love? <laughs> right? Marriage. <laughs> love and marriage. <laughs> that, that'd be a nice final paper. Explain the symposium within the context of the Princess Bride. <laughs> that could be an alternative paper. Really? Yes. Seriously? Yeah, if you, you want to. Like that should be only for non philosophers. Pardon? For a paper? Sure. Yes, of course. Of course, that's a sign. That's a sign of virtue. Okay. Uh, what is love? What is love? Love is the <laughs> love is the desire for an end or for a good that one currently does not possess. Aquinas builds on this in the Treatise on Happiness, right? Love is a desire for an end that one currently does not possess. It is the desire for an expected good. 
or it is the desire to preserve a good that one currently has in the future. So love is not simply of beautiful things, it is of good things that are good and true. So Socrates is going to argue, this is what love is. Anything, anything, whenever we speak of the qualities of love, it has to be something that participates in what love is. Yes, Diotima clarifies this. Yes, that's right. So this, so then he says, the person that taught me this was Diotima, the old lady who saved Athens by figuring out how to get Athens to sacrifice properly during a plague. She delayed the plague for 10 years. So Diotima knows what love is and she can explain the works of love. I think this is an example of persecution in the art of, of, art of writing. That Plato is giving his doctrine through Diotima. Through an old lady who could easily be discarded by everybody in the dialogue and by everybody reading it. Yes? Um, that definition, uh, this desire for an expected good, how does that differ then in like a Christian context from hope? Hope, hope is, this definition of love is natural hope. Crazy? I was crazy once. They put me in a room. It was cold. I died. They buried me. There were worms. They drove me crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once. My roommate, when I was a graduate student. And then I repeat it to my classes and to my sister. <laughs> How does your boyfriend know that? I don't know. It gets around though, because when I mention in class, there's always a few people that know it. Say it again. Crazy? I was crazy once. They put me in a room. It was cold. I died. They buried me. There were worms. They drove me crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once. Is this a joke or is he actually? And then you just keep repeating it. <laughs> it's a joke. No, it's a joke. It's a joke. I thought your Who's Michelle? <laughs> Did I tell her that? No, I don't. I don't think so. I told that to my sister when she was ten. I told it to my sister when she was ten, and she just she liked it so much. She kept going around the house repeating it, and my and my stepmother eventually smacked her. <laughs> yeah, I would have too. <laughs> Oh, man. It didn't. It didn't help their relationship. It what? I also taught them the George Washington Bridge song, <laughs> and then eventually that that upset my stepmother too. You sing. You sing like George Washington Bridge. Set. You just repeat George Washington Bridge over and over again. Set to the the monkey music from the from the. No 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 da 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 da. And then, but every time you end it, you begin the next verse on the next syllable in the phrase. And then you go through the whole song, you go through the whole phrase that way, five times. Anyway, don't, oh, try this at home, not, not during class. But, but kids, little kids love it. And the, like my little sisters, when I taught it to them, they would go home and sing it over and over again. And they drove my stepmom nuts. So anyway, but it's a nice way to keep little kids preoccupied. <laughs> Because they just keep trying to sing it over and over again. <laughs> oh, that's so true. You just sing George. We'll, we'll, we'll sing it after class tonight. Yeah, maybe that's why I'm still a freshman. <laughs> anyway, Diotima explains what love is. Basically, what comes out of the conversation between Diotima and Socrates. First of all, is that common sense or custom often approaches the truth of things, even if it lacks a reason for them. This is the problem, you might say, of love and marriage, right? That we have a lot of good customs and laws that regulate love, but we need to come up with a philosophical defense of custom and law. True happiness... True happiness is not just to possess what is beautiful, 
but it's also to possess what is good. Love, love, love is first of all a spiritual thing. It is neither a God nor is it human, but it is a spiritual thing. And therefore, right, the soul, why? Because the soul is spiritual and the soul is the highest good of man. So whatever must be true love must be what the soul can love. Right? Love, true love would be the soul possessing the object that is appropriate or properly measured to the soul. And then the body and the soul being conformed to this end. Does this make sense? Okay, so love is first of all spiritual. Why? Because the soul is spiritual. So the desire of the soul must be a good. It must be a good that is appropriate to the soul or that is properly measured to the soul. Love must be the soul possessing this object, right? The end or the good that is appropriate to the soul. So the, the, the way of true love would be a way of poverty. Why? It would be a way that doesn't care about money or pleasure. The, the way of true love would not care about money or pleasure or reputation or honor or glory. Right? If the, the true lover, if it had any of these things, it would still lack what it truly desires. In fact, you know, Aquinas builds on this. So It's so obvious. I mean, I, I just read Aquinas. That's why I say it's so obvious. Aquinas is building on this. Right? So even if, even if someone has money or pleasure or power or honor or glory, there, the, the desire of the soul still exists. The desire of the soul is still not satisfied. So the soul, even if it has these things, it will still scheme to possess the good and the beautiful. The true, the true lover will be like a philosopher in his best moments. He will know that he does not know and he will be seeking to, to, to discover that which he does not know. And in some sense, you could, I, I would argue that this is what, this is what engage, this is like reading this and reading the Republic helps me understand the relationship between engagement and marriage. Engagement is a time where the two people are committed to each other, but there's no, there's really no physical intimacy. And in some sense, what they're doing is they're setting the standard towards which they will be struggling the rest of their lives to, to reach after physical intimacy confuses the whole thing again once they're married. Right? True love between a man and a wife is like a philosopher. I mean, true love is the soul... What is true love? True love is the soul obtaining the object of its desire. But its desire cannot be the pleasure of the senses. It could not be food, drink, sex, money, honor, glory, or power. Right? Because all of those things are measured by the senses. So true love has to be the love, the person, the soul, obtaining both unity and also obtaining the object of his desire. So what would engagement be? What is the custom of engagement? The custom of engagement is a time when the man and the women, the man and the woman, and I'm speaking about monogamous engagements, not polygamous engagements here. We'll speak about polygamous engagements later. But in monogamous <laughs> engagements... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> in monogamous engagements, right, the man and the woman, they are, they are dedicated to each other, but there's no physical 
intimacy. There's no physical consummation of the relationship. They're expressing intimacy, ideally, in, in engagement. They're expressing intimacy in a platonic way. In other words, they're, they're training themselves. The whole purpose of courtship and engagement is to basically not engage in physical intimacy. Why? Because you're, you're, you're training yourselves to learn what true sacrifice is for the other person. Which is a kind of non-physical sacrifice. Once you get married, because of human nature, this is going to become all clouded again. Because of why? Because of the physical attraction and the pleasure of the senses and all that other kind of stuff. Not that those things are bad. Those things are a participation in, they're an imitation of, they're a shadow of true love. But they're not true love. This is not to say that they're bad. It's just to say they're not true love. And if you give in to them in an unrestrained way, in any kind of relationship, it's going to lead to trouble. Right? That's the point. Pardon? Just affirming what you said. In other words, this is the point of the argument here. So, still, even that being said, true love is a kind of poverty. The soul is lacking. It, it doesn't. Money doesn't satisfy it. Power, pleasure, honor, glory don't satisfy it. It's always lacking what it really wants. It's always scheming to get what it really wants. What is it, though, that it really wants? True love is the love of the Logos. Right? Because that is it, true love is what the philosopher loves. It's the Logos. It should make you happy. Because why? Love... Again, love is the possession. Love is the desire for a spiritual good. Love is realized when the spiritual good is possessed. When the spiritual good is possessed, the soul will no longer have desire for it. Its desire will be satisfied. Yes, you can. Um, so, once that good's fulfilled, <coughs> is the soul not capable of love anymore? It's only capable of... Uh, no, it is capable of love, but it, the love is then permanent. I mean, the desire is then always there. And it's always satisfied. Right. The love of the soul satisfied is not a pleasure. But if love it's the desire of the soul being satisfied, which is not pleasure. Diodama makes it clear that it's a desire for something that is lacking, or the desire for a continuation, a permanent continuation of something that you already have. Right. We all have this desire within us. We participate in this desire in different ways. But there is only one kind of love that is whole. Any other kind of love is a partial imitation of this whole love. Any other kind of love, right? The love for reputation, honor, glory, sex, food, drink, pleasure, any other kind of love is a partial imitation of this true desire that we all have. Sports, philosophy, money, he names these explicitly, they are all secondary. And I think there's an I think implicitly in this section he speaks of the sexual appetite as well. He doesn't name it directly. Why? He doesn't want to offend his audience. Because they're all assuming that somehow the sexual appetite is the basis for understanding what love is. And there's a critique of it here. There's, there's an implied critique of it. So the ultimate form of love is a kind of unity or a union between the lover and the beloved.
In other words, there's a unit of love. I don't understand why uh, there's a distinction between the lover and the beloved in an ideal relationship. Well, the, the, the lover is the person who loves. The beloved is the object of the desire. No, I mean, I understand what the distinction is. I don't understand why there should be one. Should they both be they lovers? Should both they should both be lovers and be beloved. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Socrates definitely doesn't make that clear. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, I understand what? that. I, just, yeah, I mean, speaking as an eye or something. Yeah, I'm not going to argue that. Yeah. Right. Well, ultimately, God has loved us first. And our effort in life is just to learn how to love Him back. Right, but in relationships with people. There has to be reciprocity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but God is a person too. Well, because I mean, I think God is a person. I think in um, right in Alcibiades' speech, um, I think the, the I think that's where the cultural idea of the lover and the beloved becomes clear. Okay. Um, because Alcibiades makes it quite clear that there's two. The person who pursues is the is the lover, and the pursue is the beloved. Is the beloved right? And, and and Socrates doesn't love him back. Right. At least in a physical way. Right. Um, and that distinction, I, that, I don't know. I just. And this is, this is going from a specific to Catholic perspective, but in the theology of the body, JP2 talks a lot about, like, yes, there is a reciprocity in the relationship, but there is, like, a definite distinction between the male humanness and the female um, receptiveness. Like, there's, there's a distinction. And so, like, if you want to look at it in kind of those terms, like, there is a natural distinction um, in the relationship, and it kind of defines the relationship, even though there is a reciprocity to some extent. Maybe, but I think... Are we being lost in a small point? Okay, let's go on. No, it's okay. I just want to get out. I just want to go on. So, true love, the first criteria for love is unity. The second criteria for love is procreation. In true love, there is eternal possession of the good. This was, this was uh, Sash's point earlier. Right? And then a true love will be eternal. And true love results in a kind of giving birth. But it's a giving birth that is both in the soul and in the body. And so, in true beauty, in a true beautiful act of love, there will be reproduction. There will be a kind of preservation and an immortalizing of the person. And then he says, some seek, the sophists seek all the secondary loves. Right? They seek honor, pleasure, power, and wealth. Some, he says, some seek this immortality through the family. This is the love of virtue. He says, sorry, he says there's another kind of love, which is the love of virtue. This love leads to the protection of family, cities, and houses. He says it requires virginity. It's, it's the love of virtue that leads to having the having of spiritual children. The virtuous soul is a soul that cares for its body. And then he treats all other persons as if he were a brother to them. He sees, however, that his soul's beauty is more important than his body's beauty. So what's going on here 
is that he's saying the highest, the highest form of love seeks unity. Related to a corollary to the highest form of love is procreation. The highest form of procreation is spiritual children. The second highest form of procreation is reproduction of real children that leads to the family, the city, the neighborhood, and the preservation of man. All other kinds of love are cheap imitations of the highest kinds of love. Yes. No. Right. So then, from this point of view, then everybody is living for virtue, there would be no good. No. No, because there are only some. You need you need procreation for the preservation of the species. There are only some who uh, are capable of living the virtue that's required to live celibacy. Yes. In other words, sorry, many people need marriage to live virtue. In other words, if they don't have marriage, they won't be able to live virtue. And they'll never arrive at this idea of unitive love and procreative love. Yes. I don't know why he says that he says that everyone would rather have such children than do that. Right. That, yeah. And it was just like I was I mean, just from like a logical standpoint, like if that is the standard for everyone and everyone would go through that, then that would mean there's like anything that Well I think what he's that, saying I think what he's saying I think what he's saying though is that the desire that we have within us the, the, the thing that the true desire that we have within us is to teach others virtue is to have spiritual children in other words that's the that's the kind of even if you have children it's not enough just to have children what really makes you happy when you have children is to see them become virtuous well that's the point if you're married you got to do both well you don't have to. I mean, if you're sterile and married, you you don't have children. But that's not a bad thing, right? But if you if you are married, you want to have children, and you also want to see your children virtuous. I would think. But I mean, friends like outside your immediate Couldn't you say that that the best or preferred thing would be to like to have your own children that you teach to be virtuous? I don't think that's the way he says it. So why would he think that it's better to like teach like a friend rather than like your own? It's better because because spiritual children are a higher the, the spiritual children. They give fruit to something that is higher in the soul. Whereas the reproduction that leads to uh, physical children, it's not that it's bad, but it can very easily be confused. It can very easily become confused. And if someone doesn't marry, they can become mentor or father or mother to many more spiritual children than if they marry. Plato and the Academy, I mean, just kind of think of it in practical terms. Plato and the Academy could become the the uh, the teacher of many more disciples than could Plato as a married man having, let's say, 10 kids and trying to raise them. I, I don't think I don't. The other thing is I don't think Socrates or Plato would ever argue this in a Kantian sense, which is which is the way we kind of almost by default try to push it. I think they would argue that there are some people that can live celibacy and there are others that can't, and that there's there's a there's the the good way to live is marriage, but the better way to live is by having spiritual children if you can do it. So it's not to say that one is bad or we can dispense with. 
It's just to say that there's one that's superior. It's like ordinary versus extraordinary. Yeah. And by the way, I mean this is a this is a teaching of Christ. Whoever leaves father, mother, wife, children, lands for me and for my name's sake will be given a hundredfold in this life and much more in the life to come. Not without persecution. Right? So, the hundredfold has always been interpreted as a hundredfold in the sense of spiritual children. Would that also mean just from a church standpoint, like, could they use that to protect the reason why, like, as an argument for the reason I have Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Actually, the last thing I was going to say about this, I'm, I'm going to say it not last now, I'm just going to say it now. This, the argument of Diotima, this is the argument of the Pope in Humanae Vitae against contraception. Right? That there is a unitive love. The first love that unites man and woman is a unitive kind of love. In other words, the love that brings wholeness to the relationship. For this to be true unitive love, the marriage has to be open to contraception. Oh. It's to <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm tired. But for this, for this to be, for this to be, turn me in. I get fired. Actually, that you probably wouldn't. I I get tenure for saying that. I'd become I'd become I'd become chairman of the theology department. <laughs> No, you're chairman of the Elgin Dean. I've become dean of the College of Arts and Letters. No, so the marriage that is truly unitive is also, in other words, the primary thing in marriage is seeking unity. But if you use contraception, you are creating an obstacle to unity, to unitive love. So the marriage both has to be open to unity, which is unity of love, and also open to children in every one of its actions. If it's not, you will burn. I mean, <laughs> no, if it's not, over time there will be problems. If you want to, if you want to almost, for example, if you want, uh, if you want to just look at the numbers of divorce, just from a sociological standpoint, if a couple uses contraception, the divorce rate goes up to like 60 or 70 percent. If you add in that they have had premarital sex, it goes up to like 80 percent. If you add in that they have cohabitated, it goes up to like 90 percent. So in other words, what's that a sign of? That's a sign of the natural law at work. Right? If you violate the natural law, it will somehow eventually manifest itself in the behavior. And I would argue, I mean, probably, I don't know, I don't want to say anything more. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just going to say that, like, if you look into the actual, just, I know this, from, no, I, I know this from knowing people. I know. So go ahead. What? I know this from knowing counselors who deal with marital problems, or who deal, or priests themselves who deal with marital problems. That uh, oftentimes, if a couple comes to someone and they have marital problems, the first question they ask is, "Do you use contraception?" And oftentimes, when they say yes, the person just says, "Well, stop using contraception, and you'll see your marital problems will start to diminish. They won't go away." But they, they'll start to diminish. And that, that, that in many, many cases, that's the case. Right? That contra Why? Because contraception leads the husband and the wife to start looking at each other as objects of pleasure. Right? You're there for my pleasure. So it makes sense that over time, the husband or the wife is not happy with that. I don't want to be an object of pleasure. <laughs> right? I want to be more than just an instrument. But that's also why I think it's hard, if you accept contraception, 
It's hard to argue against homosexuality. Because it's, in, in essence, if you're using contraception, there's not much of a difference between homosexual love and contraceptive love. Both, are, both in some sense, are sterile, and both, you know, are, are instrumental for, for pleasure, or they could be that way. At least, at least at the very least, the pursuit of unity is separated from the, from the pursuit of procreation. It's just like the speech of Pausinius or Agatha. Well, Pausinius. Pausinius. So, it's good that we have customs that educate us. Right? It's good that we have marital customs that help, and, and laws that help young people live virtue in this regard. Because these laws and these customs, they introduce us to the kind of struggle that is necessary for us to undergo so as to obtain the ultimate desire. In other words, this is the beginning. In this passage here, we see the beginning of the outline of the, of the struggle to grow in virtue. Right? The mountain of virtue that I handed out to you last year. Right? Because... Yeah, I do. I I kept my I, cool. I kept the best ones. It's my background on my phone. I didn't I didn't keep all of them, but I kept the best ones. What is the big edible one with candy? Last year I made <laughs> last year as an option for my class. Seriously, I didn't do this for your class, but see, every year I try new things. So last year in the I, I had them draw out the cave, Plato's cave, in the spring. Yeah, I didn't do it in the fall. Because I didn't learn about it until oh, 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 until the uh, I didn't learn about it until the someone told me that a, pro a professor at some small <laughs> liberal arts Catholic college somewhere has his students try to artistically draw out the cave. So I had my students who wanted to do that last semester. Mine had a bike in it. And Sash did it, yeah. Sash did a copy. Then this other student brought in. A candy version of the cave. That was tremendous. It was awesome. <laughs> Did you eat it? Yes, we ate it in class. <laughs> he even gave us permission to partake of the goods. That's right. It was the food. It was so good. What does that represent, though? Huh? What does that represent? I'm just kidding. It's Al Gore. We're taking it all that's, in. So yeah, that'd be a great. That'd be a good final paper. What? Not what is the allegory of the cave? What does it mean to eat the allegory of the cave? <laughs> <laughs> now it's gonna be twelve to twenty-four. <laughs> oh my God! I don't think I that'd be a, that'd be a great question for like an existentialist philosophy class. <laughs> no, no. If they were existentialists, they get caught up on the meaning of the word eat. <laughs> so customs are good, right? Because custom, good customs, will educate people. They will teach people to pursue knowledge and wisdom such that they will really start to learn how to love. So you're saying that like marriage forces people to become better people? They can, yes. They can stick or, or customs that help people become celibate. Why? Because good customs will help train people to seek what is always, what does not change. And in seeking what is always, they will seek to love correctly. So it's like philosophy for Joseph. Yeah. Good customs will help people to realize that beauty and good are not in gold or clothing or boys or food or drink, but in divine beauty and true virtue. He mentions boys, and I got to mention it. Right? So this is why a society needs to regulate marriage in two ways. We should regulate marriage in two ways. One is through custom. Custom is preserved through families and through ethnic groups that preserve unwritten laws about marriage. Right? So you got to get engaged you got to be engaged for six months. Like the church, 
Well, actually, the church's laws, laws are written. Right? But there are a lot of good customs about marriage and engagement. And also, there's a lot of good customs in the church about, about, dis, about discerning vocation. Right? Someone who is 14 and a half is old enough to start to discern their vocation. Someone who's young is old enough to start discerning their vocation. You don't need to be 22. Because you can be mature at 14. The question of whether you should be celibate or married or when you marriage, it's not a question of age. It's a question of virtue, of maturity. If a person is 16 and they have the virtue, they can do it. If they're 30 and they don't have the virtue, forget about it. Right? It's not a question. Some people say, well, what's the right age to get married? Well, it depends. Are you, are you virtuous or not? Also, it's also, the, it's also the fact that if you enter into marriage with the ideal of being prudent about it, but then also of remaining faithful to each other, marriage will teach you virtue if you lack it. Right? So a young person who's 22 getting married will will mold and become virtuous. Whereas the person who's 30 and stuck in a life of vice, marriage might never help them. But our marriage will be much harder for that person. Whereas marriage for a person who's 27 but they have virtue, they too can deal with marriage. Right? So the, the independent variable, the most thing the, the most important thing to look at as far as marriage goes, is would be virtue or the intention to develop virtue. If you have those two things, you can get married. Or you could be celibate. Thanks. Next, Alcibiades enters. Enter Alcibiades. Alcibiades is drunk. But... I think Alcibiades, in a way, it might be on mine. It's not on mine. She'll bring you one. <laughs> Basically, first of all, Alcibiades starts ordering people around. That's because he's a man of the will. He's a man of an unrestrained will. Then, he says the same things about Socrates that Nietzsche does. He calls Socrates a satyr, an S-A-T-Y-R. He calls Socrates a satyr. He says that Socrates uses philosophy to seduce people and to possess their souls. He says philosophy is ultimately a kind of frenzy, a kind of Bacchic frenzy. And this is how Nietzsche also uh, makes, makes out um, philosophy. Alcibiades is the perfect example of a guilty conscience. Right? He says that every time he speaks to Socrates, he gets seduced, his heart beats faster and faster. Why though? Why does he why does his heart beat faster and faster? It's because Socrates makes him feel like his life is worthless if he doesn't live virtue. Socrates makes virtue the standard of living. And Socrates makes Alcibiades feel terrible if he doesn't live virtue. Why? He points out his many poor ways of living and his vices. So Alcibiades says when he leaves the presence of Socrates, he has all sorts of good desires to live virtue, but then as soon as he leaves the presence of Socrates, he fails to live virtue. The problem with Socrates is that Socrates takes boys and he convinces them that beauty is not what they should strive for. Right, that they should not strive for refinement or pleasure or the beauty that comes with those things, but that they should strive for what is good and virtuous and noble. And then Alcibiades tries to basically dishonor Socrates. 
He tries to make him look bad in front of everybody else. And why? how does he make him look bad? He basically says that Socrates never seduced me and he never let me seduce him. In other words, he says that Socrates never entered into a platonic or a physical homosexual relationship with me. And this, and he says this with the point of trying to make Socrates look bad. Right? So he says, Socrates tried to train me in virtue. He tried to enter into a mentor relationship with me. And he didn't accost me. Right? He didn't make me a little boy in a pedophilia relationship. <laughs> then... He says, when we were in the gymnasium, sorry, <laughs> then, she heard what he said. She heard what I said. And now she's scared. She's scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, c'est la vie. I, I doubt they're going to let us continue reserving. No, no, they will. They're going to give us the royal treatment next time. <laughs> they may even give us the vows. Then he says, <laughs> then, then Alcibiades says, I went with Socrates to the gymnasium and he didn't corner me in the locker room. <laughs> this is basically what he says. Right? Then he says, we had dinner together, we had dinner together alone at how, in, in, you know, in my home or his home, someone's home, and he turned me down. He, during the whole night at dinner, he wouldn't treat me as any more than his brother. Right? In other words, there was no hanky-panky after dinner. And then he says, basically, Socrates, he showed character, he showed moderation, and he showed fortitude. And then he praises Socrates, right? He says, Socrates, during wartime, because he lives virtue, he was able to suffer through all sorts of difficulties in ways that the other soldiers couldn't suffer them. He knows how to dominate the hot and the cold. In the midst of war, when everyone else was just shivering and in the trenches and not knowing how to act, Socrates could dedicate himself to spending the whole day solving philosophical problems. And then in battle, in battle he kept his serenity, he kept his peace. He wasn't detached. He wasn't detached and otherworldly in battle. He kept his serenity and peace and he actually helped in what were very difficult circumstances so that the retreat would go well. And he wasn't concerned about honors or rewards. So that after the battle, he didn't seek any honors and rewards. And he let other people gain the honors and rewards. And so basically, Alcibiades says, Socrates, you're a deceiver like no other deceiver. You deceive people by living virtue. You deceive people by controlling your passions. And you deceive people basically by looking better than anybody else but then not receiving the awards, either financial or reputation or glory and honor that other people receive. So I condemn you, Socrates, you SOB. Right? Yes. Um, there was one, one line where Alcibiades says that Socrates always drinks with everyone and can drink as much as everyone, but they've right. never seen him drunk. Right. I really didn't, I was wondering what, like, what it was intending, like, if he was trying to say anything, because it, my only problem with that was, like, if Socrates was drinking as much as everyone else, yeah. that's not no, really I, moderation. I think what Plato th says by, I think the argument there is that somehow Socrates doesn't drink as much as everybody else, right, that he somehow... It's not that he's like a superhuman, right? No, but it's just, it's just that somehow when he's at these drinking parties, he just, he doesn't drink it, he, and nobody notices how much he drinks. But yet he doesn't not drink either, right? So, he, you know, it's like he's the guy that has a couple glasses of wine and then no more. 
I think that's the point. As far as Plato would be concerned. <coughs> so the, di the dialogue ends. Is basically, Socrates convinces every. He basically says, well, Alcibiades, you're drunk and you're just upset that Agathon didn't sit next to you. Right? And everybody at this point goes along with that little, uh, little diversion. But Plato, I think, is using this scene to reveal to us what Socrates is really like. In other words, that, that, that the true, true virtue, in as much as it exists, it will exist in a person. And Socrates is the best embodiment that there is of true virtue. And because Socrates lives true virtue, he also can explain in the best way what love is. He's also the true philosopher. In other words, the truly virtuous man or woman is virtue, or sorry, the truly virtuous man is, is master of his actions. Right? He can, in every situation, he can moderate his passions so that he can do what is good and avoid what is evil. So that he can do what is just. So that he can serve others. He can keep his peace and serenity so that he can serve others. So it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to grow in virtue so that one can basically serve others. Right? Because when, when one has virtue, one is attached to the true good and one can see all other goods or all other loves in relation to true love. And that is all I have to say. <laughs>